Hey, hey, hello, hello. We are looking at the top nine anime of 2023. These are all shows that I've talked about at greater length in uh, one of my four seasonal anime review videos uh, that I put out throughout the year. Uh, I'm really proud of those videos. I think I get into some, you know, real meaty analysis. Uh, but I recognize that maybe not everyone wants to watch something that's the length of, like, a feature film. Uh, but it's just me talking about anime. So I decided, oh, I should make this list, like, to the point and just kind of talk about should you watch this or not? You know, what kind of audience does this attract? What will you get out of it? To the point. <laughs> no, no need for rambling digressions and stuff. So, you know, let's get on with it. We are first going to talk about, at number 9, Edo My A Elf. This is a delightful example of the special and special interests recluse genre, which is a kind of burgeoning genre among manga, and uh, it's one that I think really kind of only exists in anime and manga and such, uh, because it's one of the like wish-fulfillment genres. Um, things where you have a character that is just kind of living an idealized life that connects with the typical manga viewing, anime viewing audiences, and is like, hey, you in particular don't need to aspire to anything else. What if you were just a reclusive, enshrined goddess elf uh, that didn't have to do anything all day besides collecting things and playing video games and reading manga and lazing around and eating snacks. Uh, basically, the general wish fulfillment of this category is, what if I didn't have to go outside, I didn't have to do anything at all, but for reasons explained in each individual premise, that was totally fine. And then other good things just sort of happened in my life. Uh, this one's nice because you learn not just a whole bunch about otaku culture, which is kind of the standard for the this genre, but the gimmick here is that the titular elf is like 3,000 years old or something insane. Maybe that is insane. Maybe she's only like 500 years old. Uh, but she knows about historic Japan. She knows about the Edo era of Japan. And she talks a whole lot about how today's fads and games and trends uh, kind of relate back to some of the social... Uh, dynamics and stuff of that era, which is a lot of fun to learn about. And they, they depict it in this, like, really nice kind of old-style woodblock print. And then, you know, even though this genre is very silly and wish fulfilly, and you could argue that maybe it's, like, not overly beneficial for the mental health of the watchers to have this very blatant, uh, pandering wish fulfillment, but when you really break it down, like, what is this a story about? It's about empathizing about understanding people's weaknesses and strengths and fears and opportunities, which leads to growing ability, a, a growing willingness to explore the world outside and to grow as a person without ever really being judgmental, without ever really saying there's anything completely wrong with what you're doing. There can just be more. And I think, you know, maybe, maybe that is a nice message uh, for people aspiring to be the Edomae elf. Next, we have this great shot of a man too stupid to know how to open doors, so he just takes them off the hinges. This, of course, is M.A.S.H. from the series Mashal. It's a very silly, very fun battle shonen that combines, I think, the charm of Saitama, the protagonist of One Punch Man, a guy who is cheat code level good in some ways and then shockingly ignorant, incompetent, or careless in other ways, but kind of makes it all work. It operates within this, like, extended, very goofy Harry Potter parody that takes a lot of the elements and doesn't really even, like, iterate them that much, but just sort of puts them in stark relief to the main character of Mashal, uh, of Mash, sorry, making it all just obviously just nonsensical. And generally just the logic of gag manga and gag anime where... Uh, at any moment, they're just kind of setting up punchline after punchline after punchline. It's a ton of fun. It only gets a bit tedious when it takes itself seriously as Battle Shonen, and you're expected to really care about the outcomes of battles of <clears throat> side characters and kind of the long tension before MASH does something absurd that just instantly wins the fight. 
but it's like okay. It's not, you know, super compelling as Battle Shonen, but it's a little bit nostalgic, I think, because it writes uh, these scenes in such kind of a route traditional way. So if you grew up watching Dragon Ball and stuff like that, the the pacing and the logic and of it of and such is gonna be very familiar to you. Maybe my favorite part is the very incoherent aesthetic combo of this series. Like, the school setting is supposed to be this Harry Potter parody, so it's, like, very stuffy, very Britishy, very proper, pomp, and formal. Uh, then there's this recurring motif of the shoe cream that M.A.S.H. is obsessed with making Japanese-style cream puffs, and this shows up all over the show's iconography and motivates a lot of the sillier plot lines. But then, on top of that, the soundtrack is just kind of like this weird... <laughs> Uh, not weird in and of itself, but, like, almost, like, weirdly normal, kind of, like, modern Japanese hip-hop. People will just kind of be, like, ambiently rapping. You'll, you'll transition scenes with, like, turntable scratches. Uh, it, it feels very kind of, like, mid-2000s in a way that's really appealing to me. Uh, and the result is that it's a lot more than the sum of its parts. Uh, it creates, out of these kind of, like, stereotypical or Proteus elements... Uh, something very unique and I think very charming. Um, we've started watching the second season in our anime club. I don't know if we're going to be able to finish it. I'd like to finish it myself at least. Uh, it's just a lot of really go good shows this season. It's pretty stacked. Um, but they, they've really, I think, even pushed this dynamic further with like an ED where it's like they're hanging out with cool cars in the middle of Tokyo for like no reason whatsoever just for the comedy of that juxtaposition but all of these elements the more kind of like inappropriate or arbitrary they are the more it just kind of creates this very unique blend so yeah good stuff next we have the second season of a jujutsu kaisen uh if you're following anime at all you've probably heard some stuff about jjk uh, i'm really actually curious like i don't have a good sense of how far the series' reputation has spread, or what people's conceptions of it are, if they haven't been, like, following it and watching it and stuff. Like, what, what have you ha heard? Let, let me know in the comments, uh, people who are at that distance. Do you know any of the big twists that happen? Have those penetrated mm, more mainstream, not anime watching consciousness? Do you know who Gojo is? <laughs> Gojo's a big deal. It seems like everybody kind of loves this character, even beyond the the limitations of the show. Has that penetrated your, your social sphere? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, like, this, I think, has been hitting a certain type of popularity and appreciation. I certainly haven't seen since Demon Slayer, at least. But in some ways, it feels like people are gushing over it even more than they did Demon Slayer. Maybe that's ridiculous, but, like, that's just sort of the vibe I'm getting. And if you're hearing that, if you're hearing, oh, this is, like, the GOAT battle shonen, well, no. <laughs> that's just hype. Should just go read One Piece. But it lives up to the hype insofar as that MAPPA is making this a phenomenon. This is, like, the most concentrated effort I think I've ever seen put into one of these big mainstream shonen uh, adaptations to just, like, push further and further into this audience to live up to their expectations more and more and just, like, wow them. And you will be wowed for sure getting into this season. Uh, the first season, I think, is still very solid. It's, like, a fun watch. Uh, again, it's just very route battle shonen stuff that you'll probably enjoy if you like that genre. But the second season, I think it's worth sticking out or just randomly plunging in not knowing what's going on. Just for the sheer audacity and insanity of the fight scenes and how crazy well they're animated. Just to, like, witness that makes it, you know, anything else, even any level of disinterest or whatever, totally worth it. It's crazy. It deserves its phenomenon status. You'll be impressed. Next... Yeah, hair in my mouth. At number six, bleh. Bleh. we have Osama ranking the treasure chest of courage. Uh, so this is the follow up to a 2022 show that I really, really enjoyed. It was kind of like a surprise hit to me. 
uh, this runaway success where the original manga was drawn by a businessman who was totally untrained. He just kind of drew it on a whim. It's very kind of amateurish. It feels almost like outsider art in some ways. But it gets published. It becomes this big cult hit among manga fans. And then Studio Wit, uh, you know, a very uh, major respected studio that has this huge fan base that's developed over like decades now, uh, swoops in and delivers this amazing, excellent adaptation which became then a pretty big crossover hit, like hitting audiences that, uh, you know, typically you wouldn't watch something uh, that seems this niche or is this kind of out of line of typical shonen. Um, you know, all sorts of people were watching this to the extent that I, I think I saw merch for this in Hot Topic one time. Right up there with the Jujutsu Kaisen merch. Uh, this, this rampaged beyond anyone's expectations. And I think it's telling that Studio Wit is really trying to keep the ball rolling and capitalize on this momentum um, because they couldn't just adapt more of the manga as a second season because the manga isn't really that far ahead of the anime. Uh, last season got up to, like, I think one volume away from where the manga was when it was airing. Uh, so they need to put in a placeholder. They need to wait for more manga to adapt, uh, which is kind of a shame because the manga does really crazy stuff after the anime finished. Some of my favorite arcs have been unfolding since then and tons of just absolutely wild developments. Um, but this is really nice too. I was so impressed with this kind of anthology series that adapted some bonus stories from the manga and like the volume versions. Uh, some just brand new creations from Studio Wit. It used a variety of art styles. You really got to hone in on a lot of different characters. Um, a huge range of emotions expressed. Uh, really wonderful stuff. Uh, back in the day, they would just slap together a filler arc, right? Like, <laughs> if this was Naruto or Bleach right back in the day, and they caught up with the manga, it's like, oh, guess what? The, <laughs> the Leaf Village ninjas... Um, I don't know, uh, they have to escort a princess to this other kingdom that we will never hear about ever again. And there's evil ninjas on the way that are from uh, yet another kingdom that we will never hear of again. And let's have a good 12 episodes where <laughs> we sort all that stuff out and then suddenly, wow, it gets plot relevant again. That was the trick they used to do. But we are living in truly a golden age of adaptation where instead... Uh, they, they have the courage and they, they have the conviction to put together this really lovely anthology series. This is a great franchise in general. I really highly recommend people check out the first season. I think it has really wide appeal. I think everyone can get into it. Uh, just one of a kind style of storytelling. The, the way that's expressed in animation, the characterization. It's wonderful. At five, we have the second season of Spy Family. You know, speaking of this golden age of manga adaptations, Spy Fam, it kind of looks like they're just going to keep adapting it. They have a huge hit on their hands. The studios involved are absolute masterfully executing all of the different styles required of the series. Uh, this, I think, is one of the most universally lovable series that are like running right now. Uh, for almost anyone out there, I would recommend this as a wonderful entry point into modern anime and manga. Uh, we, we really have the trifecta. Three genres that combine like chocolate and peanut butter uh, through the conceit of the series that are all, I think, individually uh, very charming and appealing. We got wholesome found family bonding, just goofy kids being kids shenanigans. And then thrilling spy and assassin adventures. Although, <laughs> I, I've noticed <laughs> uh, there's, there's been kind of a shift of opinions on this series, which at first was, you know, so universally praised and beloved. People are getting sick of the character Yuri. <laughs> and his creepy obsession with his older sister. Uh, people, I think, at first thought that was going to be just a very minor plot point. Uh, that kind of shuffles out of the way after one episode. And now I see people complaining a lot on Twitter about this guy and we've had enough of him and get rid of him. And why does every single anime have to have one extremely creepy or problematic uh, element to it? 
Uh, I don't think it's that bad. It's just a stupid joke. Um, I don't think that should dissuade people from watching it. I think this takes the beloved formula of those three genres interwoven perfectly and pushes it into new territory with this like huge, ambitious, really masterfully written cruise ship adventure arc uh, that I think is like a masterclass in how to write a an arc in a long running shonen series that you know highlights all of the different characters has great kind of A, B, and C plot crossover and cohesion, has a perfect kind of rolling tension that never feels too bogging you down in one emotional space. Uh, great stuff. I, I think one of the highlights of the series is, is animated in this season, and you, you can't miss it. Next we have uh, Skip and Loafer. Uh, my, my favorite manga rom-com... Definitely my favorite manga running, uh, rom-com running right now. Maybe my favorite rom-com of all time. That one, I'd have to think about a little bit more. I don't know if I would include, like, Yuri series in that, because then it gets really contentious. But nevertheless, it's way up there, and it gets an, an absolutely wonderful adaptation here. Uh, not only, I think, is this a great rom-com for rom-com fans, like, anybody who likes that genre and has been watching that genre... This has got to be on your list. I think this is also a perfect entry point into the genre. Because a lot of the kind of most popular rom-coms that people point to... I don't know, say your Fruits Baskets, or your Love's Hinas, or your Nisei Koi's... They, they have kind of some, like, <laughs> stupidity. And, and it's not enough to ruin the series, obviously. Like, those are classics for a reason. But it's kind of like certain tropes and hallmarks of the genre uh, that are often very fun on their own terms, but in other ways, I think kind of just make the genre maybe a little too tropey for people, that they, they roll their eyes and go, well, of course they're going to have something like this. <laughs> of course they're going to do a bunch of jokes like that. And if you're just getting into the genre and you haven't really kind of like uh, built up your appreciation for such things and, and seeing kind of how each each series iterates on them or whatever. I could see that being kind of tedious. And this series has none of that. This series is just so mature and down to earth and, uh, you know, it, it's full of social realism. And I've been thinking a lot about this idea, especially with Dungeon Meshi airing now. And even though that's a completely different genre, I think the, the core strength of both of them is really considering this idea of social realism, that all of the characters should interact with each other with, like, a depth of humanity that, you know, you would actually see in real life and not just kind of absurd caricatures bouncing off of each other. They really focus on how each character would see each other within the lens of their unique understanding of society. Like, not just here is character A and the qualities of character A, but here is character A in this tight, self-looping mesh of what character B thinks of character A, what character B thinks as the social climate of their school, how character B sees character A fitting in with that social climate, and all of the sort of judgments and empathy and consideration that comes into that, like, many-layered social dynamic. I think they bring that out in, like, every character in, in such a compelling, heartwarming, relatable way. And, and really, what this all requires is a writer that truly, truly loves their characters. Not that they coddle them, not that they make them perfect, uh, not that they want you to also fall in love with them, at least not right away. Um, but they have such consideration for the characters, and they don't cheap out on them, they don't do them dirty. Um, but they let them breathe and live like real people. I, I think that's what makes Skip and Loafer so special and so rich with meaning and emotion and and why this series has made me cry more than almost anything else these days. Check it out. Read the manga, really. It gets so good. Like <laughs> The anime is great, but it doesn't even cover what I think is like the pinnacle when I really, really started hitting for me. At number three, we have the new pseudo-revival remix adaptation of Scott Pilgrim, 
Scott Pilgrim takes off. Do you remember this guy? We, we haven't really seen much Scott content in like 10 years now. Uh, he's from Toronto. Hey, me too. I think this is the perfect time to revisit the series, uh, to kind of see what all the fuss was about back then when it was like a veritable phenomenon. Uh, just sort of judging the distance from it between now and then I think is very interesting. I think in many ways it was kind of like a cultural touch point at the time, but then culture has certainly moved on in a lot of ways since then. And then you can plunge into this absolute banger anime. Uh, you know, if you haven't really watched much modern anime and you don't know how great it is, <laughs> uh, just how amazing... Uh, some anime are at taking every opportunity that the art form provides, uh, studios that breathe such creativity and innovation into like every frame of it, like Sai and Saru. Um, it's a great opportunity to like check that out without, you know, having to take on an anime that's like really an anime. <laughs> uh, you know, you could watch Bochi. But have you ever seen a slice of life anime before? Do you do you think you would like that? <laughs> Can you bring yourself to care about this kind of mundane story about girls starting a band in high school? Um, I don't know. <laughs> For a, bet, I, a lot of anime non-viewers, maybe that's a little intimidating. Maybe that's a little uninteresting. Or maybe, you know, you want to see another absolute pinnacle of anime production... It's time to watch the masterpiece that is the Monogatari series. Oh no! There's like 3,000 fetishes in every single frame. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. It's, it's kind of tough because a lot of these really innovative boundary-pushing anime exist in territories that are very like deep and dark for uh, people that aren't already into anime. So I think this is a good vehicle. You, you can even watch the dub, you know? <laughs> and just check out how awesome animation is these days. And it's a great way to enjoy uh, something that's all too rare these days, which is like a silly, unpretentious meta-comedy. One that I found genuinely very funny and very clever without like really, you know patting itself on the back for being the smartest thing you've ever seen. Uh, like, I'm so sick of meta comedy in general. I think in, we, we haven't really seen many genuinely funny ones in, like, over 10 years. Uh, but just, this just nailed it for me. I, I was really laughing at a lot of the ways that they kind of remix and refer back to the original comics. Okay, at number two, we have... Another Netflix series, Pluto, back-to-back uh, -back Netflix original shows in 3 and 2, projects that I think never would have gotten off the ground without Netflix. Uh, I'm begrudgingly really coming to respect their anime department. I think they're putting out some really, really brilliant series and taking some big risks that other uh, like production companies and stuff wouldn't really give these studios the same breathing room, the same budget. Uh, I'm, I'm begrudgingly really starting to respect what they're doing here with these Netflix anime projects, but <laughs> I hate that they keep batch releasing them. Batch releases is just like shooting a show in the kneecap. I, I'm so pissed off every time they do this, and it doesn't seem like they're going to stop anytime soon. If you watch my recent uh, fall 2023 anime reviews video, I explain in great angry detail why I think that's so bad for the long-term success of a show. But anyways, moving on from, you know, the reason that you probably haven't heard of this yet, uh, they took a modern classic manga that never really broke out of the zone of, like, manga for manga fans. Like, this is gonna sound, I don't know, maybe, like, a little weird and pretentious, but <laughs> uh, I read a lot of manga, right? And I've noticed there's a pretty big line between people who regularly just kind of read at least some new chapters of stuff every single day and are kind of constantly reading older series and discuss, you know, the oeuvres of artists and stuff uh, versus people who maybe have read some manga but always kind of like secondary to anime or whatever. There's, there's basically just kind of this, like, different culture that exists around manga uh, that I think is quite insular, and there's stuff that pretty much, like, anyone who's in this culture 
Like, to give an example, I'm in a few Discord servers where I talk about manga. I'm sure everyone on those servers has read Pluto or at least heard of it. And then I feel like almost everyone I know, even people that are into anime that are outside of those servers, it's maybe like 30% of them have heard of Pluto. That was a rambling explanation, but I think it's an interesting phenomenon. And I think it's funny how big something can grow as manga and just never reach outside of that. So I think it's amazing that Netflix looked back into the early 2000s, saw this classic series, and adapted it so faithfully, like basically like panel by panel, uh, you know, not truncating anything, making it this sprawling, roughly eight hour long epic. It's excellent. It's an excellent series. This compelling mystery of, you know, hitting the streets detective work, but then also very philosophical, mysterious sci-fi where they're pondering the meaning of different things experienced by humans and robots. And then also you get some pretty sick, nasty, big robot fights. What, really, what more could you want? I feel like the reason Netflix did this is because they're trying to bridge the audiences between your kind of like prestige TV watcher and your anime watcher. They think there's like a Venn diagram overlap zone where if they are exposed to the right kind of anime series, these two different groups will start to see the appeal of one another and branch out. And I think that's a pretty sensible, even admirable goal. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I think for me the biggest thing, because I, I, I started thinking like this, like if I was, you know, a prestige TV watcher, mm, I'm really into Fargo, I'm really into True Detective, ooh, this anime is kind of like, supposedly it's hitting the same kind of notes, I'm going to check it out. I think the biggest thing is like, you can't compare <laughs> something that was written as like a single season of a TV show with a manga that ran every month for six years. <laughs> Those have vastly different writing methodologies and vastly different kind of expectations for how they're going to tell a story. Uh, so don't expect, like, the level of cohesiveness you would get out of, like, season one of True Detective or something. You gotta be prepared for a bit more of, like, a rambling structure, I think is the best word for it. A structure that's kind of prodding around and, and seeing what's gonna work and what's gonna click with audiences as it's being developed. Um, but otherwise, I think it is a really good fit. I think this has a lot of the things I look for in prestige TV dramas. Um, and executes them really, really well as an anime. So check it out. Finally, <laughs> we have at number one, Heavenly Delusion Tengoku Daim... Daim... Miao? Daim... Something like that? Daimaku? Tengoku Daimaku? I can't remember. It means Heavenly Delusion. <laughs> and this is... This is the show for the prestige TV fans, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's really edgy. <laughs> uh, a lot of really dark, horrible things happen in it. It's really violent. It's full of tension, excruciating tension at points, and huge twists, and mysteries that'll have you speculating at the end of every episode. And that's what Prestige TV is all about, right? <laughs> No, this is like an anime for anime fans. Um, and, and typically, I think, like, a lot of the stuff I don't really like in anime, typically, like, pretty much all of those things I don't look for in anime. Um, but it succeeds in other areas so amazingly in some aspects that I really attribute to being an anime and existing in this, this medium and being adapted from manga and, you know, inheriting a story from that medium. And then just, like, other stuff that I really appreciate in, like, books. <laughs> um, and, and it's such a powerful, like, brand new kind of feel that I don't think any other show has really appealed to me on this level. You know, I, I, I talked about this show a lot <laughs> in the seasonal reviews. I, I very manically became obsessed with breaking down all these different axes of well, this group knows this, but that group knows that, and we, the viewer, know this, but nobody else has figured that out, and nobody knows about this, and all the permutations and quadrants and then octants and stuff you can make from all those subdivisions. 
Um, I, I really obsessed over this because I felt like a key to why the show is so compelling is within that. And then also, I, I talk a lot about the idea of a zone, um, which to me as a concept traces back to like Gravity's Rainbow, but I think is well expressed in a lot of different stories as a place, often that's kind of post-apocalyptic, where normal society has ground down into dust, and people kind of spontaneously to their own ambitions have started recreating this kind of ad hoc society and just kind of seeing like how all the mundanity of the real world has now recreated itself in eccentric, interesting, charming ways. Uh, I think this show realizes that almost as good as anything else I've ever seen. Really god tier animation, like action sequences that even though are sometimes very cliche in their motivation, have such insane visuals and are so compelling and fluid that you just are almost hypnotized by them. But then the character acting more than anything, just the facial expressions of the characters, sometimes so comedic and goofy, sometimes with this really distant aloofness that just kind of draws you into the character, sometimes with, you know, such raw horror, passion, sacrifice, despair. Mm, it's so good. Like this this is what I, I crave in anime is, is being able to convey those things through drawings of the face. Like the artistry behind that I just think is so cool. And really, like as I alluded to at the start, there's some pretty insane, unnecessary, like totally sicko shit in this series. Like ideas that you'd have no reason to include if you're ever being marketing minded, <laughs> if you're ever thinking about, you know, what will appeal to people, stuff that is totally orthogonal to that. That's what the anime is all about, baby. That That's why I watch this stuff in the first place. You get a single demented mangaka. <laughs> demented is maybe a little harsh, but they certainly have a demented vision uh, you know, this this insane autorial story that only they can produce um, brought out by the sole creator and then amplified and enhanced uh, through publication, through editing, and then finally through animated adaptation, bringing it to this much larger audience, exploding it out onto the screen. Beautiful, beautiful. I can't wait to read this series. I, I was gonna like hedge my bets a little bit because I love this adaptation so much. I would wait to watch just more of it animated and not spoil anything for myself. But I, I really want to know what happens. <laughs> I think I gotta start reading the, the manga soon. It's so great. Okay. Those are the nine shows that I would recommend most from 2023. Please check them out and look forward to uh, winter 2024 anime reviews, which, you know, there's some bangers. <laughs> there's three shows where the second season is airing now that would have made this list. Um, things that I'm really, really impressed by, so I'm very excited to talk about those two. Okay, and with this, I'm done all my 2023 videos. We did albums, we did movies, we did Western TV, video games, and now anime. That's it. That's five for five. I'm, I'm very, very happy. Uh, I always love making these, but, you know, it's hard to prioritize making YouTube videos over other stuff, and then I get busy this time of year. I'm busy all times of the year. Uh, and then it's just kind of like, uh, will I get these done? When am I going to get them done? You know, I had to freaking watch Pluto. It's like eight hours long. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really, really happy. I was able to finish all of this off within the month of January, which to me is a, excuse me, big W. All right, look forward to other stuff. See ya.